Good morning and welcome to Global Halfcast, a summary on dengue with three short lessons. I am Joe Schmidt and with me is Melvin Senecas. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone watching um, our Global Health Cast today. We just want to give a short introduction with a general overview of clinical aspects and the epidemiology of dengue and dengue virus. And basically, the summary is that dengue is an acute systemic flavivirus virus disease. It is caused by four closely related but antigenically distinct dengue viruses, and they are named dengue virus serotypes 1, 2, 3, and 4. The virus is transmitted to humans by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, rarely by Aedes albopticus, and the reservoir is humans and non-human primates. Clinically, 75% of infections are asymptomatic, 20% result in a mild, unspecific flu-like disease called dengue fever, but very severe in 5% of the infections is dengue hemorrhagic fever. And we explain the difference between the two and why dengue hemorrhagic fever happens in a second podcast, very short podcast later on. Now, case fatality rate with the severe disease globally is 2.5%. It may be much higher in some areas and much lower in some other areas. Today, half of the world's population is at risk for dengue virus infection, and we show you the risk areas around the globe later on in another podcast. And 100 to 400 million cases are reported annually. There is no specific therapy, but prevention is possible with who vaccines today and there are other other ways of non-medical interventions how to prevent the disease which is also available in our podcasts and if you want to see more about the vaccines this is the link to it that you will find in the show notes now let's go a little bit to the history and the main reason for us today to i i don't want to say alarm the world on dengue virus particularly the world in europe right uh, dengue virus is increasing. We see an increasing burden of disease, and this includes temperate climates. This is because there's population growth, there's urbanization, uh, increasingly favorable ecological and environmental habitats for Aedes mosquitoes, and by poor vector control and certainly international travel that bring the mosquitoes to different places around the globe. The disease was probably first described by Benjamin Rush in the late 1700s. There have been outbreaks in the 20th century in the continental United States. The description of hemorrhagic shock um, with dengue virus was in Australia, in Greece, and in Taiwan, as you can see here. And then uh, early in the 1900s, the transmission of the virus by Aedes mosquitoes uh, was shown uh, again early in the 20th century. The viral etiology was proven in 1906. And since 1942, we know that there are at least two strains. And uh, then after 1945, we have seen pandemics. So the epidemiology of the disease is changing. The areas of transmission is changing. And only with modern technologies, we are now able to identify the virus with, with enough certainty to, to be able to say that this, is a, this has become a global problem. Now, just going back to the transmission for flaviviruses, and the dengue virus is a flaviviruses, there are two ways of transmission. One, on top you see a mosquito, and on the bottom you see ticks. And listed here, you see the mosquito-transmitted flaviviruses and the tick-transmitted flaviviruses. Among the tick-transmitted flaviviruses, particularly the tick-borne encephalitis virus, in German-speaking countries called Frusoma meningoencephalitis, FSME. But then there's also OMS hemorrhagic fever, Kyasanur forest disease in India, Povassan, like in the United States, and many others. Among the mosquito-borne, on top is the dengue virus. And interestingly, they are not that closely related, right? They are closely related antigenically, but not that closely related, as you can see here. Look at the tick-borne encephalitis viruses. They are much closer related even to lung gut hemorrhagic fever. And actually, one vaccine covers all these different entities here at the same time, and probably also lung gut and Kyasanur. Let's go ahead on the global distribution. 
Classically, the four flavy viruses that are most relevant are yellow fever, and they are observed and diagnosed in Latin America and in Africa. This is the areas, and I understand now recently there have also been cases in Southeast Asia. Japanese encephalitis is uh, a disease, a flavivirus that is seen in um, Southeast Asia to down to the tip of Northern Australia. Just the tip of Northern Australia is endemic for Japanese encephalitis. Yellow fever and Japanese encephalitis, there are vaccines out that the yellow fever is used globally for international travel. The Japanese encephalitis virus, there are several vaccines, I think at least 11 that are used locally and produced locally, and there are national programs out there. West Nile virus is found globally except in Latin America, and tick-borne encephalitis has now been diagnosed from the United Kingdom to Japan and from Siberia and the polar circle down to Tunisia. So this is wrong here. There is an oasis here in Tunisia where tick-borne encephalitis virus has been identified. This is the distribution you should roughly know about of the four relevant flaviviruses, and except West Nile virus, the three of them that I mentioned are vaccine preventable. If you have a more global picture, and here I listed some of the flaviviruses that are more relevant from a clinical point of view. Yellow fever virus is the one that causes hepatitis. That is uh, the hallmark of yellow fever. The other dengue, the other flavivirus called febrile systematic disease with hemorrhagic fever or CNS disease. And again, hemorrhagic fever, hemorrhagic fever, fever, um, arthritis, rash congenital disease with the Zika virus, but then again, CNS disease here with the others. So it is very relevant to know about this disease and to be able to diagnose them wherever they are as the global distribution is currently changing. If you want to see more information, here are our podcasts, the links to our podcasts, and you will find these in our show notes. Melvin, any question from your side on the summary of dengue viruses and dengue disease? No, this was excellent, Professor. Just a, a question on flaviviruses in general, um, especially the flaviviruses um, transmitted by mosquito, right, that you have shown here. Um, there's a, there are a lot of them, and most of them, um, I would say, we don't have vaccines yet, right? So it, in your opinion, is this something that um, should also be added into the, the list of priority pathogens that should be um, in the research agenda uh, of, of, of the world? That is a very good question, and I really would consider this. I, I think you're, this is a very good question, and I cannot agree more. Uh, uh, Tick-borne encephalitis is increasing. The numbers have been increasing lately, year after year, in Europe and in Asia. The issue with tick-borne encephalitis virus is that it's not diagnosed. Many areas in Germany are considered to TBE virus free, which is wrong, but physicians don't diagnose because they are told this is a non-TBE area, so you don't need to waste your money on the test. And it looks a little bit more uh, for dengue. I mean, who thinks of dengue infection if there is a patient coming with a mild fever and a flu-like a flu-like disease, a little bit of cough and a little bit of headache, myalgias, arthritis? So I think we need a little bit more awareness for flavivirus diseases, and we need more testing and more systematic testing or surveillance. So I think this is a very important point that you made, uh, uh, Melvin. Yeah. Thank you very much, Melvin. And uh, with this, uh, thanks for joining us today. I am Joe Schmidt, and with me was Melvin Senecas. Goodbye, Melvin. Goodbye, and please check out our other podcasts on dengue. <laughs>